in here. Okay. Cool. Um, welcome, everybody. And I know that we have still quite a few people who are going to be tuning in and slowly joining um, over the course of this conversation. So welcome whenever you join us. Um, we are super, super, super excited and honored and grateful and humbled to be um, talking with such a badass panel. Like just look at how beautiful everyone is on this panel and I just feel so grateful. Um, and uh, yeah, this is part of our Because We've Read a unit on surveillance and terror tech. So for October and November, 2020, um, and for those of you who, this is your first Because We've Read event, welcome. Because We've Read is a radical international book club um, and organizing group uh, that has chapters around the world that encourages conversations about specific topics and then mobilization in communities on those lines. Um, and if you have to jump off early, um, feel free, because I know that it's also like 2 a.m., 3 a.m. for some people. But um, we're also going to be announcing two exciting projects that we're going to be kicking off for this unit as well at the end of this conversation. So stay tuned. And if you miss it, we'll upload this. Um, and also, if you're on our email list, we'll also shoot you all the details there. Um, so yeah, we are so excited. I'm going to just quickly introduce people and then we're just going to dive in because I have like a trillion questions and I'm very anxious about the number of questions that I have. Um, of course, also feel free to jump in with questions at any po any moment, either in the Q&A, yeah, there's like a Q&A thing, um, or in the chat, but preferably in the Q&A because I think people are just going to talk in the chat because people are still talking about where they're tuning in from um, and what time it is. So feel free to drop it in the Q&A. Um, and we can address it if it's relevant as we're talking or we'll save it at the end. And then after um, I go through my questions because I'm greedy, uh, then we can go to the Q&A afterward as well. So um, without further ado, I am excited to introduce Dr. Simone Brown, who is an associate professor at the Department of African and African Diaspora Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, she is also a member of Deep Lab, which is a feminist collaborative composed of artists, engineers, hackers, writers, and theaters. Um, also, she is the author of the book that we are reading. Where'd it go? Um, one of the books that we're reading for this unit, Dark Matters, um, on the surveillance of blackness, which we're so excited to dive into. Um, and it also was her first book, so I'm just kind of really excited about what you have coming next. This is your very first book, so um, congratulations on this gem. Um, we also have the wonderfully beautiful Asiya Bendawi, who is a, an Algerian-American journalist and filmmaker, not based in Chicago. Your bio says you're based in Chicago, although we wish you were based in Chicago. <laughs> um, you've been a reporter, or she has been a reporter for BBC, NPR, PRI, Al Jazeera, Vice, and CNN. Um, and her feature-length debut, The Feeling of Being Watched, which we also have linked in our additional resources, which everyone should definitely, definitely watch it. Um, has its world premiere at the 2018 Tribeca Film Festival, and she's currently a fellow with the co-creation studio at the MIT Open Documentary Lab, where she is iterating her most recent work, The Inverse Surveillance Project, which I'm very excited to ask you all the questions about. Um, then we have Sara Hamid, uh, who is an abolitionist and organizer working in the Pacific Northwest US. Um, she leads the Policing Technology Campaign at the Carceral Tech Resistance Network, and co-founded the Inside Outside Research Collaboration, the Prison Tech Resist Research Group. And finally, last but certainly not least, we have Freddie Martinez, um, who is a founder and executive director of Lucy Parsons Labs, with an S at the end. Everyone always gets that wrong, including myself, um, which extensively documents police surveillance in Chicago and across the country. He is an activist, security engineer, and technologist. Also, apparently, he's a physicist. Um, he was previously a Mozilla Ford Foundation Open Web Fellow at the Freedom of Press Foundation. Ah! Okay, amazing. Thank you. I am like very excited that this is happening um, and grateful for all of you and your time and just your skills and expertise. Um, just really quickly, just so we have a better sense of like who you are and like all of the incredible work that you're doing right now and like emitting into the world. Um, can we go around really quickly and just talk about a little bit about your work? And I know that a lot of the things that we talked about in this unit may have been older work. Um, like Asya, you're working on new things. Um, Dr. Brown, you're working on new things. So what, um, can you talk a little bit about the work that you're involved in, um, including what you're doing right now? Um, and then also answering the question of what your relationship 
is with technology. Like, how do you engage with it? Um, do you like it? Do you hate it? Are you kind of working with it? What, what, what does that relationship look like? Um, so we can start with Dr. Brown and then go around. Hi, this is so exciting to be here, um, you know, on this panel and um, just seeing all of the different, um, uh, because we read uh, chapters all around the world and it's been quite an honor to have so many people read and engage um, with my work. You know, I'm, I'm a professor, I'm a teacher, so that's, you know, what I'm doing uh, now and also the various service works that we do in these um, uh, departments. I think my relationship to technology now is mediated through these moments of Zoom where I teach and work and do all of the, the meetings that, that we have. And I think that, you know, this was a, a really quick fix um, for a lot of organizations and universities and other places to have, you know, these kind of platformed communications. But, um, you know, we've seen uh, quite recently the way that Zoom is uh, enacting like its back door to shut down um, any type of critique um, of the Israeli government um, or even people that are um, you know, having talks about Zoom uh, surveillance. And so, um, uh, so yeah, so I, these, this, these are the troubling kind of things that I think about, um, you know, tech, with these technologies, like what is their political aims and, um, you know, how much of that do we have inside, how much control do we have of these, um, you know, these things when they're in our homes and mediating the way that we communicate and organize. Anyone can jump in. Or we can go around. First time, okay, but we know, we just go to everyone talks. Um, Asya, do you wanna go next? And then we can just go to Freddie and Sarah. Sure, um, yeah, I, I wanna echo what Simone said. I mean, I'm, I'm, I hate that all my communication is mediated through technology right now. I mean, it's extraordinarily frustrating. Like my access, my only access to the world is through tech and I, I miss in person. <laughs> You know, I miss having conversations. I miss being able to communicate in other ways. Um, and yeah, it's frustrating not knowing what, you know, knowing that we're surveilled through it and and still it being in like nascent stages of understanding what that means. Um, so yeah, it's really frustrating uh, that my relationship with technology is a frustrated one right now. Um, what am I working on right now? Um, I'm working on the inverse surveillance project. I, um, I'm lucky to have this fellowship at the uh, Open Documentary Lab at MIT, where um, basically I have um, tens of thousands of uh, declassified FBI documents about the surveillance of, of my community. You know, every month I still get these, you know, a CD-ROM from the FBI with redacted documents. And um, I am working on, answering the question, how can artificial intelligence compel a radical transparency in um, government data when uh, the government redacts so much of it? Um, and so, you know, using, uh, thinking of how we can use AI to um, fill in meaning in disappeared information and in redacted um, government documents. Um, and that's, that's, exciting and interesting. I'm also working, um, I mean, we're, I'm, I'm a filmmaker also, and we're in such upheaval in our industry right now. And um, in this moment of emergency, so many of, you know, the old inequitable uh, systems are, are coming back to replace the old ones. Um, and so I'm, I'm, you know, a part of a working group with um, BIPOC filmmakers, independent filmmakers, where we're thinking about, you know, what is, um, you know, what is a radical narrative shift look like? Um, and what does it look like to like own, own the means of production? And, and so that's really exciting doing, um, you know, work in this moment of emergency to reimagine our industry and reimagine the field. So that's been, uh, that's been really exciting and generative. I'll pass it on to Freddie. Yeah, thanks, Asia. Um, so my relationship with technology is, I mean, I've kind of stepped away from the technical world and I've done more like professionally, I do like more like public policy type work, which is like not, it's, it's a lot different um, than like sort of abolitionist radical organizing that I've been used to. Or um, actually I don't, I, I wouldn't call myself an organizer. I, I think a lot of what 
we do, and, and I'll just be clear, I'm just a public face of Lucy Parsons Lab, so I'm not the one who does all the work, um, but I'm the one that gets in front of the cameras. Um, a lot of what we do is document, um, and I think um, really what we try to do is document like harms that, that, that come out of surveillance. Um, so like giving you an example, um, if you're placed on this, uh, you know, in Chicago, we have this thing called a strategic subject list, and, and it basically, um, it's like a way for police to get, provide services to social services to people. But um, in reality, what happens is uh, if you get charged with a crime and you're on this list, you get the highest possible uh, punitive penalties. Um, and so we're trying to really like document, like what does that mean? What, what are the harms of surveillance? Um, so we have like this primer that we updated over the, la the last summer um, with one of my colleagues. Um, we do a lot of public records requests um, and, and so we get a lot of documents on police data. Um, and so uh, just documenting a lot of uh, police sort of abuses. Um, and then the other thing is that we, we've gotten, a, ever since the uprisings in May, we've had a lot of interest in one of our um, projects, which we call Open Oversight. Um, and it's basically, we take police data that we get through public records um, and then try to uh, crowdsource photos of police officers. Um, and so you take your bi their biographic data, like race, gender, age that you get to public records and then allow the community to sort of um, upload photos of them, sort them, tag them. Um, the, the sort of the, the background for that project is someone was abused at a protest and they told us, well, I didn't know who it was, but if I saw that officer again, I would recognize them. Um, and we've been seeing um, this project got picked up by a lot of different places. So like I know Portland has an instance that they, they rolled out. Um, and you know we've seen places like Verm Burlington, Vermont have like a huge amount of coverage. So something like 70 or 80 percent of the police officers um, tagged. And and so you know that's another project that LPL has been driving. Um, so just thinking about like a lot of different ways of like not just like how technology is used. Can we use it in a way that's like not abusive? Um, like can we turn it around on the police? Um, so it's a little bit of everything. It, but it's a lot of documenting. It's a lot of public records requests, and it's a lot of just talking to people about like our ideas, both as like sort of, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's, I consider it like radical documentarians or archivists, but, um, but also doing it through a lens of like sort of abolitionist um, theory too. So it's a little bit of every, every all over the place. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what we've been up to for like the last year or so. Sorry. Mm. So uh, I'm a community organizer full time. This is what I do. Um, and I think the two things that I would say I focus my time on is building community defense and building campaigns. And um, by community defense, I think it has a lot to do with um, how do we learn with directly impacted communities and how do we develop a way of understanding technology together so that that knowledge and that practice of inquiry become sustainable. So for instance, um, even though the pandemic has brought the world to com a complete halt, it's also facilitated a lot of connection making in ways that we haven't had before. So we've started um, with Care Oregon, one of the organizations I work with, um, community forums where we're able to convene online. And we've, we're doing this with multiple organizations, in fact. And um, work through things like budget documentation together and do research together and do it in a way so that we can start developing our own curriculum and our own way of understanding what these technologies are and how they're being rolled out without a over-reliance on experts, essentially. Um, and then campaigns are how we mobilize that knowledge. So as technologies get rolled out and they get rolled out very, very quickly and they're experimented and then they're deprecated, and then there's con this continuous life cycle, um, how do we mobilize against them? And oftentimes because the lifespan of these tech are like six months and they get deprecated without us even knowing that they were there in the first place, these are usually very much rapid action um, campaigns. So how do we articulate demands and how do we then mobilize people power behind those demands so that we can start uh, essentially pushing back against the rollout of these technologies and some accountability for the harm that they cause during their experimental phase. Um, but right now, all of my time is being focused on defunding the police. Because even though a lot of the, um, the uprisings over the summer um, 
they some of them have simmered not all of them uh i think that yeah that that it's just it's it's going through budget documentation is like taking up all of my time right now so that's what i'm working on uh because we're still very insistent on holding the ppb accountable for um what they did both this summer and what they've been doing for decades now. thank you yeah um and i think that that's really helpful and interesting just because i think that there's like like i like for example also you're using ai like tech, like you're using technology, sorry, you're using different types of technology. Um, and Freddie, you're like documenting it. And Dr. Brown, you're just like researching it <laughs> and talking about all of these theoretical underpinnings. So I feel like all of these relationships are really interesting in the way that um, like how, how are we like crafting forms of resistance without like also like is like technology is not inherently bad, right? Like, and how can we kind of like balance that the way that tech is being used and will always be used by structures of power versus like tech in and of itself as like a tool um whether it's for furthering state um oversight um or transparency or even right now especially during COVID, a lot of people talking about contract tracing um which if it was happening in a country that was not oppressive which would i guess no country right now in the world <laughs> um that could be a very useful way of being able to like track and like limit spreads of the virus but when also the government has access to contact trace there's also all of this other like ads of surveillance that comes with that that is just very like intimate um we see a lot of campuses rolling out a lot of really intimate sort of um, contact tracing a lot of um like state departments and so i'm just wondering like how people are sort of navigating and balancing that tension between like using technology versus the way that it is being used um and like how yeah how you navigate that relationship or if you even think that it's a challenge, like, or if it's, or I'm just thinking it's a challenge, it's actually just very straightforward. <laughs> I mean, I think all the time of like, you know, how do we, how do we flip predictive policing on its head, for example, how do, how do communities uh, stay safe and like what Pred what Freddie was just talking about, the project they're working on identifying individual, you know, law enforcement and getting as much data, that's one of the ways, you know, you can do it in, in, in you know, kind of a low tech uh, way, but um, I think, you know, I, I think that, you know, there are tools and um, and we can use them, you know, in different ways. I think that, um, you know, like, you know, it's it, it's been said many times, but the algorithm is not neutral. It's 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 who's writing it and who's writing it for who um, that matters. And I think that it's really important that organizers are creating the technology as well. Um, people that are using it for counter surveillance um, for keeping our community safe. Um, I think that's, that's all really important. I think it's dangerous to be wary about the whole thing in general, you know. I, I will say that when the uprisings began, you know, I think there was this temptation to like try to figure out how do we use tech really more broadly um so we, we we did see some things like we, we did get you know people were asking about how to stay safe at, on protest lines and things like that um but like the project that i worked on was making sure that the bond fund website didn't go down and like making sure people have access to jail funds and things like that i think i think you know that that's what happens when you're in communities with people it's like um the bond fund people just came to us and said hey we need help and because you have like these community relationships like we don't have to like that trust is already built in you know we don't have to get to know each other we we've known each other for a decade um some of us and so i think this temptation to like i think look at tech as solutions is is really like i think it's really misguided because i think what really matters is that community relationship um in a lot of ways and and i think that's way more political and way more important than um any kind of like software project although i i know i do think that ours are important um i think more broadly i think we should be thinking about community relations and, and popular power and what does that actually look like and then using tech to sort of enhance that but but i will say that most of the time like community organizations need help with like their emailing lists and like um, their websites and, and making sure that this thing is available and and can I contact people when I need and you know we hear a lot of like you know how do you set up a phone tree you know and, and that's way more I think important um, than and we actually in way in a lot of ways way more political um, than than any kind and radical than any kind of like software project um, so so even though like a lot of us are super technical I think a lot of us are also like 
trying to navigate that space where it's like actually like, that doesn't matter as much. Um, and so, so I, I'm very wary about you know technologists who, who see things like these uprisings and want to contribute. And it's like, well, go donate to your mutual aid network. Like that's what people need resources. People don't need uh, you know another Google software engineer. Um, so that's just kind of the ways we've been thinking about it. And and it's very hard to balance all of these things because like again like that's our background that's that's where we come from um but i think it's just being realistic about like what does community need actually look like so <clears throat> i know that some of the work that we've been having to do um, especially in the Oregon scene is anti-doxing protection because there's this active campaign to find personal information of organizers and weaponize that against them. And so I also feel, yeah, I have a little bit of an antagonistic relationship to technology right now because you recognize that you've just left these like crumbs of yourself all over the internet for the past two decades and, you know, and mail is showing up and we're, you know, in your front door and you don't know where it's coming from. And it's like, it can get very, very scary, very fast. And so I want to shout out to the folks at Equality Labs that's just holding it down for organizers all over the country right now, trying to get us safe and build that curriculum. But yeah, it can, it, it yeah, it's not just the police um, and the carceral state that put you at risk because of their technology. Now it's also people, right? and individual actors. Yeah, um, thank you for that. And I, I want to now like switch gears just a little bit and kind of dive into the book um, and bring out some of these like themes that I think are really, for me at least, were like especially powerful. Um, and, um, and then maybe Dr. Brown, you can expand upon them for people who may not have read <laughs> yet. <laughs> um, and so I think one of the things that really struck me when reading this. I mean, it is so powerful. Like, I feel like we could talk about it for like five hours, but we won't. Um, I think something that, and it's kind of related to this question also that we just discussed is that um, the earliest forms of surveillance, um, as you talk about in this book, was not technology. Um, it was like a racialized white gaze um, upon like black people who were enslaved as property. And so it was like, it's, so it's not like the fight against surveillance and technology is not against the technology itself, but more so the frameworks that are underpinning it, like themes of anti-Blackness, control, power. Um, and so I just wanted to know if you could just kind of lay the groundwork a little bit for like where a lot of the surveillance tech um, that, or the logic behind it that we see today um, against the Black community, but as well against um, non-Black Muslims, immigrants, refugees, um, Black and Brown people just across the world uh and the histories of that at least in the united states you mute it. i did i did mute it because there's a train that runs periodically in the in the background there and so i think um i so this idea that technology is you know depends whose hands that it's in um is is sometimes kind of like an easy play because we, you know, we could look at a, a technology as simple as a pen and there could be you know something quite problematic and if we where we buy it from amazon how is it being sourced you know what are the different materials that um, make it up and so i think when I, what i was not i think but what i was doing there is to, is to look at um race capitalism colonialism uh various different isms as technologies like the business of getting things done but also look at technologies as in tools um physical tools meaning that um and this is just one way to have an entry point to think about surveillance to historicize it through um uh, black diaspora studies and there are various other you know angles that can be taken as well to to you know historicizing like the history of the fingerprint in um colonial um british ruled uh, india uh, other spaces in which these um you know technologies that we see now as biometrics um were put into um put into practice um you know and but but to look at it through um as a beginning to think about it through transatlantic slavery was to think at that time the enslaved people were the tools 
<laughs> or the technology. And so, um, and, and so that's what I was, you know, uh, attempting to do um, in that work. But to, to take it back a little bit, what got me, um, you know, interested in surveillance was um, when I was doing uh, dissertation work. And um, this was uh, in the beginning of the fall of 2001, um, right after the events of 9-11, uh, the, the Canadian government um, announced that they had the most secure documents in the world, and it was chip ready, biometric ready. And when the um, immigration minister, um, she went to the Canada-US border at Niagara Falls and had a press conference, and she held up a prototype. Um, and she said, we're not going to allow this, um, our borders to be held hostage by terrorists, by economic terrorists. And the prototype that she had was a card, and it had like a picture of what like looked to be a white woman. But the country code was LKA for Sri Lanka, and it had either like a, a Tamil or a Sinhalese name. And so there was like something that was being, like how do these technologies get rationalized? by putting, producing the immigrants is that which must be feared, um, which we have to decide, like we collectively, uh, in terms of nation making of the border of Canada, the US, decide um, who is a trusted traveler and who's untrusted. And to do this was through biometric technology. And so it won awards and various things. Um, and so that was, well, a couple things is like, how was this card ready just one month afterwards? And to think about like, there's these moments, whether it's, um, you know, the crises that we have with um, Corona or moments of insecurity where, um, you know, a whole bunch of technologies get uh, rationalized in that moment as a as a kind of big sell and we can see that now with you know whether it's cough detectors or um ther thermal kind of scanners or the use of weaponry really um at, at the time of the uprisings and rebellions this summer and and, and long before that like m wrapped kind of you know all of these kind of machinery that we see um you know for water protectors or people in other spaces that are organizing for um liberation and so that was probably a long story to get to this question about like, uh, you know, technology and being whether like, some of the technology I study is like pretty, pretty much baddies, like there's no like neutrality in drones and there's no neutrality in like predictive policing and things, but something even as simple as glitter. You know, we might think, oh, it's like party time and we use this, um, uh, you know, uh, in whatever celebratory ways, but, you know, something like that could be, or, you know, documented by the FBI for forensic uses could be used in like um, stealth technology. Um, so all of these, if you kind of historicize some of these things, how they're being bought and sold and who's profiting, um, you know, oftentimes technology is, um, is, is, is nowhere close to anything around uh, a neutrality. And so um, I guess I don't have a hope scenario kind of answer for that, but it is to, 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 to understand its mechanisms, understand it's, um, you know, not necessarily um, uh, what it can do physically, but to understand what it does politically and socially um, is, is, I guess, the angle that I take as like a sociologist. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I guess this is a little bit, you touched upon something that like made it relevant to, to this, um, question um well one person just asked uh mona asked about the glitter do you mind like clarifying what you meant in that example um, this is actually like in uh, some new works so i don't really know very much um about it but you know like glitter that you might see on like children's birthday parties or, or, or just myself i might have it as highlighter i don't want to like infantilize that it is but um uh there is you know there have been uses of that to um disrupt communication like micro dust so something like you know um disrupt electronic communications that might be thrown from the sky at some point it could be used to um uh deflect reflect and do other things around um you know flying machinery and so that is just some uh, a new kind of uh uh, project, I guess I'm starting around um, that smart dust and um, plastics. Uh, and so, uh, so maybe I'll have something to say at, you know, at some point there. But in terms of I think someone else had a question about, um, you know, uh, dark matter, um, that kind of it, will, it came up in some of the R&D around biometric technologies and the early ways in which, you know, um, darkness became something that couldn't be rendered or wasn't even like thought about. Like we were just trying to understand how to make this lightness available to be, um, you know, quantified or whatever. And so there was just the way that um, darkness um, was unseen, unrecognized and unmattered, but also to see it as perhaps um, those kind of um, 
black boxes as kind of liberatory spaces of spaces of imagination to kind of like disabuse us from seeing or or naming darkness as something that is um you know bad or the baddie but there could be something there about it being a bit um you know liberatory but it's you know i'm not a physicist or uh you know whatever those other people are so it was just more like um you know a metaphor for something um that couldn't um be mapped on to say a cartesian logic of a valence plane like man will do but it's something that's you know unnamed also if you read the book there's more about that um, there's also um, two great questions um, that are related, one by Selma in the comments and then one by Tariq in the Q&A. And they're related, but I also want to get to those a little bit later um, after we talk a little bit more about the book, but those are really good questions. So hold that thought. We'll be right back. And everybody else can like think about that, <laughs> except Dr. Brown, because we're still on question two. <laughs> um, and so, I, yeah, and I think that that, that idea um, of just like, like these theoretical underpinnings are just really interesting because I think that, and I, this can also tease a little bit into like delving closer to these questions. Um, but something that I, I guess I couldn't help thinking a lot about as a Muslim, <laughs> because I'm very Muslim, um, is just like the, like the, the relationship between these and like divinity in a sense. I think specifically um, on page 16, I think you have, and you don't have to have the book in front of you, I can read a little excerpt um, where you're kind of, pulling, you're, you're talking about how sort of surveillance um, dehumanizes individuals as they're taken out of their context and they're reassembled um, by numbers, they're reassembled for like loan rates, for example, they're reassembled in like different situations. Um, and uh, you kind of also add this idea of racializing surveillance um, and to read at the bottom of Page 16, racializing surveillance is a technology of social control where surveillance practices, policies, and performances concern the production of norms pertaining to race and exercise a, quote, power to define what is in, what is in or out of place. Um, so this idea of like taking humans out of their like literal, like tangible bodies and reassigning via data and like um, surveillance mechanisms that sort of strip the human out of us and like assign us to like these different fractured moments within like a surveillance operation. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that was just really interesting for me to read um, because it, I mean, the whole idea of surveillance, obviously this like this omnipresence watching, I think is like almost like a mimicking of like um, this idea of a divine presence, um, but also just the role of surveillance in dehumanizing and rebuilding humans on their own terms, um, on like the mm -hmm. surveillers own terms. Um, like almost assuming like a role of God in a way. Um, so, and I thought that was just really fascinating and the ways that that deeply contradicts, I mean, as Muslims, the idea that la ilaha illallah, like there is no God, but God. Um, and so I feel like that was like a very deep tension. Um, the idea of the surveillance state with the ideas of like divinity for a lot of people who are religious. Um, and so I was wondering if you could kind of uh, break that down. And also I know that there are other Muslims on this panel too. So if anyone wants to jump in <laughs> as well. Um, but uh, yeah, kind of this idea of like this dehumanization and decontextualization of bodies and uh, the reassigning um, in like different spaces by numbers or data. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I probably use that to think about things like, you know, passports, um, borders, um, census documents, and, you know, other spaces in which there's kind of, uh, you know, parts and pieces of our, of our bodies, our performances, um, of, of what makes us <clears throat> Um, get, you know, indexed in ways to, to, to more easily um, surveil. But, you know, when I'm, you know, teaching um, a class and or even, you know, um, you know, people want, what is it, what is the experience of, you know, being under surveillance uh, in ways that are, <clears throat> <clears throat> that resonate. Um, it's because you're, you're never outside of the category of human. All this is to say that I wanted to segue um, to um, Asia's um, film because I teach it, you know, every year that it's, um, you know, been out to think about those, the, the moments of contestation, um, the moments of, um, you know, when there was a time when you were uh, in the film, uh, you had gone to a meeting, I think at the mosque, and there were, you know, other, the kind of ways that respectability politics operates with, with, you know, people want to survive, you know, and, and, and want to, want to, to, to live without this, um, you know, constant presence. But the, but the, the, the presence of like, 
well, Ozzy, maybe you can talk about this too. But two things that struck me is that like the speed bump and in, in front of your home and this kind of, um, you know, the, the practice, I think that some SNCC organizers would call it like tailgating um, when your phone is being um, tapped and there's the loud click so that you know that it's being uh, tapped. Like what that, that, that those kinds of like psychic um, uh, threats, violences that, that, you know, that happen. Um, and so I'll just um, uh, a segue to Asia there to think about um, you know, what are the lived effects of those moments of compartmentalization of, of surveillance um, and then how the ways that people challenge it through the inverse surveillance project or FOIA reports or just community just talking and just knowing that we know that um, they say like a bank robbery happened over there and yet there's like why is like five different police agencies suddenly here, you know, so those are I think that's a, a perfect um, example to think of, uh, you know, what this does to a community. Thank you for that, um, Dr. Brown. I, I mean, I was reading your book as I was making the film, so it's, it's, a, it's amazing to hear that you teach it in your class. That's incredible. Um, yeah, I think like, I mean, a lot of it is really intentional. Like these are psych ops, right? Like the, the FBI conducts these like really intentional um, psych ops. I remember in the making of the film, I had, um, I had some off the record interviews with FBI agents, all who always refuse to be on camera ironically. Um, and they said, you know, this physical surveillance of the car being parked in front of the mosque or in front of the house of um, even sometimes, uh, you know, I had a really dear friend of mine who was making a film called Who Streets about the Ferguson uprising. And, and she would talk about, you know, cars would come by and a and the window of a, of a tinted SUV would come down and, and a camera would come out and they would hear the click, you know, hearing the click of a camera. Um, of these very obvious physical surveillance um, is intentional, you know, is intended for us to see, is intended for us um, to react to, um, you know, uh, to censor ourselves, to become afraid, to limit whatever activity that we were doing before. Um, and knowing that that's intentional is like, uh, is really interesting, you know, I, I mean, there's also this moment in the film, I mean, I spent a lot of time going through Cointelpro um, records, right? Um, a lot of which have been- um, Talking about what that is for people who may not know. Yeah, Cointelpro uh, was the, uh, it's counterintelligence program, short for counterintelligence program, and it was the FBI uh, surveillance operation of the Black Power movement in the 60s and 70s uh, of the Nation of Islam, of, of the Black Panther Party, of the Civil Rights Movement, of SNCC. Um, and uh, in, in the documents, you know, the FBI, there are uh, many documents that were released and um, uh, it's, it's, you know, written there, there very intentionally that these psychological operations were intended to make people so paranoid that they were discredited in the press, that they were discredited amongst their own community, um, that, that these were intentional, um, a lot of this, uh, that the paranoia is not a side uh, consequence or an effect, but it is really intentional, um, uh, intentionally planted there. And so, um, so yeah, so I think a lot of um, Deepa Kumar's uh, book, Islamophobia, in it she talks about the opposite of surveillance is not privacy, the opposite of surveillance is community. And um, what that, you know, that, you know, that there is intelligence in the community too, that there's, a, that, that we have our own sources of information, our own um, ways of, of communicating uh, information of collecting it um, that 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 is all very um, powerful too and and that subverts um, this these these really like strange ways that we get information um, during you know during a psych op <laughs> or while we're under surveillance um, and that's like a subversion too you know I think like yeah, so that, that our, our collecting of information as a community is really important. I also think of like um, uh, when the FBI was surveilling uh, um, my neighborhood, specifically, sorry for folks who haven't watched the film, the film is about the surveillance of um, my immigrant Muslim community in Bridgeview in Chicago's South Suburbs and uh, about an FBI investigation codenamed Operation Vulgar Betrayal, which went on for about a decade. Um, and uh, in many other forms continues until this very day. Um, 
Yeah, that um, while I was looking through these documents, the FBI was actually very concerned about this counter surveillance that was going on in the community. They actually said like, oh, during Friday prayers, the community posts people, you know, on uh, around the mosque. And, and, and they were like really um, affronted, you know, like, like it, was, it was a whole file just on the counter surveillance you know, that the community was doing, which was, I found really interesting, but there was so much of it that was informally happening that, you know, moms were looking out for all the kids in the neighborhood and, and they were watching and they were keeping receipts in many ways too, you know, um, that, that, that subverts it. What I mean to say is that, that that is one way of subverting this one way gaze of surveillance, that we also collect information. We're not just objects, you know, of information. We're also subjects in communication. This is Jeremy Bentham. Um, you know, that we, that we also, you know, are, are keeping our own, our own information. And I think that that is one of the ways, even psychologically, to subvert um, the, these psychological operations. I don't know if that answered the question, but this is, this is what was on my mind while you were speaking. I actually really like what Dr. Brown wrote in that part of the book. It's just about like the whiteness or the validness of a gaze, like, right? Like you go to a prison and there are the people who are caging and the people who are in the cages and like one is considered valid and normal and acceptable and the other one is is not, right? Um, and, you know, I find this a lot um, in when I'm talking about surveillance, both as like, in, or, like as an abolitionist, like, you know, people will say things like, well, what do you think the problems of this surveillance program is? And, and often we'll have these conversations where I'll say, you know, something like, well, it doesn't even work, but that's not even the point of the surveillance, right? And, and so like, how do you create a language by where you're challenging these assumptions, where you're not reinforcing these, um, these uh, I guess, normalizations? Um, and, and it's very difficult for me because I, I talk to like press a lot. I talk to um, journalists a lot and I try to educate a lot of people. Um, and, and we often find our, and then Sarah can talk about this too. It's just like, how do we talk about surveillance in a way that like we're, we reject the framing of it and also we are doing something about it. Um, and so I think, I think that it's very challenging to do that. Um, and I, I think Asya has very good, like the ways that communities disrupt that. Um, and then I'll just say one final thing about COINTELPRO and the reason that that program came to be is because a group of people broke into the FBI office, took the documents and liberated them and put them out in the community. And again, disrupting this idea of it's okay to surveil us. It's just like they just did a direct action, took documents and released them. Um, and, and again, that, that has to do with breaking the model of this is okay and this is happening to us where it's like people actually have some agency and, and they're going to do something about it. Um, and so I think, I think that question of, you know, is the gaze valid or not, I think really um, has a lot to do with uh, the ways we talk about surveillance and the ways we, we should be thinking about them. So I don't know if that gives you any thoughts, uh, Sarah, if you want to maybe. Yeah, um, no, thank you everyone for all of that. Um, I, it's interesting because as what you're, what you're saying, Freddie, it's bringing up to me actually the, in my own biography, the importance of this book, because this book, it's like no short estimation, it changed my life. Um, because I actually read it first when I was in graduate school. And I was very committed at that moment to do this like critique of technology. I had some specific questions I wanted to ask. And I was like, I'm going to ask these questions and then I'm going to write a book and everyone's going to read that book. And then they're going to say technology is bad and the technology is going to go away. And then when I read this book, I had this realization that um, technology has an amnesia to it. We forget where it comes from. We forget kind of the ghosts that are embedded in these machines that we bring with us. And that amnesia is really seductive. We get like wrapped up in it. We get very afraid. New technologies roll out and we're like, what are they doing? What are they doing? It adds a kind of paranoia to it, right? Um, and just taking a moment to appreciate the legacy of some of these systems and to actually commit to knowing that history, that process in and of itself brings in this other knowledge that Asya is talking about. It brings in oral histories. It brings in anecdotal information that our parents know, that our grandparents know, that, you know, we talk about, right? And so um, the moment at which you start to appreciate the historical inheritance of this, 
you start to make this a multi-generational struggle all of a sudden, and you start to learn a lot more about what the system is, what it is trying to do, and why it is that we're seduced by it the way that it is. I think somebody raised up a question about, like, for instance, using uh, predictive policing to police financial crimes. And I, I really like this example because it's very interesting to me because this is actually the history of predictive policing. This is where predictive policing in the United States comes from, is in the 1960s, the Chicago Police Department is doing like a department reorganizing and finance crimes and the detective bureau just happen to be across the hall from one another. And the detective bureau sees that the finance crimes and the white crimes division is using predictive, poli uh, like predictive policing and predictive analytics to go through like bank documents. And they're like, hey, we can do that for murders. And that's like that moment where that happens. So the legacy of predictive policing is the technology of finance crime. So if you want to turn predictive policing against itself, you can't do it without ignorance of that history, right? Or for instance, people who want to use predictive policing as an early warning system, right? I want to find bad cops with predictive policing, right? In Los Angeles for the laser program, if you look at the grant documentation, they actually justified getting that by talking about how dope their teams to early warning system is, which is their predictive policing program on police, right? So that history makes it so that you all of a sudden um, rearrange the terms of both your criticism and also your campaigning, because you have to understand what it is that you're bringing with you when you, for instance, create a predictive uh, uh, facial recognition technology that's for cops. You start to bring these ghosts with you. The, the long history of or rather the um, origin story of the Crushable Tech Resistance Network is this moment of realization where after all of these organizers had worked against CalGang, we realized that CalGang, which is the gang database program in California, had been effectively cloned and transferred to states where um, because of gentrification, you had a huge like internal migration of black and brown communities going into those states. And so they just cloned it. So if you dismantle it in one state, um, without recognizing that it's in operation in other parts of the country, in other cities that maybe don't even have an organizing base that can speak up against it, right? That that kind of um, historical thinking allows you to start to recognize that these technologies are very interconnected, they move, and they bring these ghosts and legacies with them. And so, um, yeah, so just a tremendous amount of gratitude for this, like this book and what it's done for me as an organizer and an individual. And I, I want to read the book that you're writing. I, I'm not writing a book. <laughs> I'm looking forward to your next book. <laughs> soon, soon, one day, yes. Um, amazing. That was a really wonderful conversation. Um, thank you for all of that. I think that relates also to another question now that was in the um, Q&A that we can address. Um, and I think also is, um, now we're jumping I had this like nice order of questions, but now we're all over the place. And it's great, it's, it, it mimics the messiness of this topic. <laughs> um, one thing also, I guess, um, is that I feel like there's also a tension though sometimes between um, like technology, like for example, predictive policing, which there's also a question about like dimensions. I haven't heard of predictive policing before. Is the history solely through the in introduction of tech in the last 10 to 15 years, or is it something that existed before? Um, and I think, we can also get a good idea of that in this book. <laughs> Not predictive policing specifically, but just like what the history of that um, comes from. But if anyone wants to take that question. But I think on that as well too, um, there's also a tension though between um, like using the same tech that I think many organizers um, are trying to dismantle though, like against the state. So for example, like facial recognition technology. Like I think part of the argument about facial recognition technology is that it doesn't work, right? It's not only racist because of the ways that the algorithm does not, is not able to like identify um, like black features, um, but also the way that cameras also cannot identify black features. Um, but also in the ways that she, like human operators of that machine are biased in the ways that it goes through. We've even heard stories of the New York Police Department use a celebrity doppelganger when the photo wasn't like clear enough to put inside, it, which drove me crazy. I think when I read that, I audibly yelled. Um, and so I, I'm wondering though, like what that tension is, like how, and I guess that also goes to the question that's in the Q&A by Tarek that says not all technology is bad, but is some technology always bad? 
Um, what are some examples of things like algorithms and AI working for social justice? Is this work that couldn't have been accomplished otherwise? Um, so I guess there's like three questions on the table for anyone who wants to start any of them. <laughs> I, I mean, and facial recognition, again, this is like the one thing that drives me up the wall. And, and like, you know, we've particularly myself in my research, like I, we, um, in my professional world work, like we um, uncovered that company Clearview AI, which scrapes social media, throws that information into facial recognition, then into a facial recognition algorithm, and you know has collected three billion images on people. Um, Wait, by, so could, by, you, could you describe Clearview a little sure. bit? I mean, also, okay, start at the beginning. So Clearview AI is a company that like goes out to the internet and grabs photos. And then it saves the photo and then like a, uh, a link to that photo. So like it'll get information off of Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram. And then, um, you know, the police department will send a, a, a photo to, to this company and they'll say, I think it's this Instagram page and here's the link to their bio. And so what they did was they created this massive surveillance program where like not only like could a police department like know off of your face, you know, your Facebook uh, friends, your groups, um, where you work, uh, you know, things like that, your Twitter. Um, and so, so it's a sort of mass surveillance system based off of facial recognition. And it created a huge sort of privacy scandal um, when the New York Times reported it. Um, and, and for me as an abolitionist, there, there's a lot of problems with this. Like obviously the collection of biometrics without consent is really problematic, but also this idea of consent is also really problematic in, in the framing of surveillance, right? Like, I think it's wrong to do this no matter what, um, with or without my knowledge. Um, then there's this other issue of like facial recognition doesn't work. You know, the, the algorithms are inaccurate and, and biased on, on racial and gender lines, but I also don't want them to be 100% accurate. I don't want like my face, like brown bodies to further, you know, be used as test beds for these algorithms. Um, I think these technologies should be banned. Um, and, and now what we're seeing is sort of activists um, using facial recognition on like police. Um, and so that brings up a lot of questions like, yes, like, you know, it's like, it's like, aha, me too, right? Like I, I gotta, I can do this too. Um, and for me, like from an abolitionist perspective, like I don't think these technologies should exist um, the government, you know, because they're the ones who are, have all the power, uh, have no incentives to sort of regulate these technologies, which, or, or abolish their use. Um, and so for me, it's very complicated. Like, like I, I, from a privacy and survey, uh, privacy and sort of technical point of view, I, I mean, I'm horrified. Um, and then on top of it, like, as a person, I'm like, not sure what we should be doing. Um, like I like we certainly want to ban this use further in Chicago and and in other parts of the country, um, but then you know what do you do because because these are used by powerful people, um, police departments and 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 the like, and and they're not interested in, in any kind of bans. And in San Francisco, uh, what they did was they banned the technology, and then they had like businesses doing the facial recognition and then giving the results to the police. Um, and so you're always going to find these sort of like, you're going to push the balloon in one way and it's going to pop the other way, as Sarah was, was mentioning. Um, and so, so I, I don't know how to do this, right? I think we have some ideas. I think, you know, working toward abolition is, is, is good, but, but then, you know, also being very vigilant that the balloon is going to pop and it's going to go the other way. Um, and how do you go and look for that? Um, and so those are just like my initial thoughts. I, I probably have more, but... Um, I think I want to jump in about the facial recognition thing um, because it's actually, yeah, the, the New York Times recently did a profile where they talked about, Freddie just linked it perfectly about its use in Portland. And one of the reasons is because when um, the federal government took an interest in the uprisings in Portland, um, a practice that was first inaugurated by the PPB and then started to be used by fed, uh, the feds was to anonymize the police so that um, because they were being so actively documented, um, you couldn't hold individual police officers accountable for acts of violence. And I think that it's, um, 
it's also telling that this facial recognition against police is happening in a city that did recently pass an ordinance against the private use in public spaces. And that there's a lot of creativity that went into that ordinance. Essentially how that happened was they uh, tried to mimic ADA protections. So they first acknowledged that it was a harm to surveil and then they tried to use the same protections that you would, uh, for instance, in public spaces require um, places to be accessible. So they used that exact same power and leverage it, leveraged it to say in public places, private entities cannot surveil because this is a harmful technology, essentially. Facial, they can't use facial recognition technology. And then this question of, well, what about facial recognition technology against officers was raised as kind of an edge case for how this might be good in some instances. We don't want to, um, you know, we don't want to pre prevent people from using it in instances which is good. But the long history of technology, which actually Dr. Brown's book teaches us, is this like constant seduction through edge cases, right? You constantly provide an edge. Well, what about pedophiles? I can find pedophiles through facial recognition technology. Well, what about this? What about that? And we don't want to get rid of it. Um, and at the end of the day, this huge surveillance apparatus that you're trying to dismantle, it doesn't survive off of the edge cases. It gets funding, it gets grants, it gets legitimacy because of the edge cases, right? And we let it continue because of the edge cases. But at the end of the day, the individuals who are being directly harmed by these technologies, those are um, what we're trying to use our campaigns to um, build protection and community defense against, right? And so I think that um, everybody gets seduced by these technologies. It's not just grant funders, it's also organizers because there's a lot of power and potential that they hold, right? But there's a reason why they have that power and potential. And the reason why facial recognition has power and potential is because it's capable of doing things like fueling our deportation machine, right? And so we can't forget that. And we have to ask ourselves when we deploy these technologies, are we willing to bring those ghosts with us as we're doing that work, right? Also, all the panelists are putting together amazing, <laughs> they're all because we've read additional resources unit in the chat section. <laughs> so to make sure to save those and upload those um, to our website also. So thank you for that. Um, does anybody also want to take the, I guess, the history of predictive policing question really quickly? And just one final thought on the financial crimes thing. Like, I, you never see something like um, the murder of, uh, you know, Eric Gardner on someone who's being pulled in for a financial crime or, you know, wire fraud or whatever it is like that. So while I do think that like those kinds of projects are interesting and they do demonstrate a sort of inherent bias in policing, um, they also don't really reflect the violence of policing um, in, in very real ways. And so I often, you know, comment about that, right? It's like, it's like I think on a, it does demonstrate as, as a sort of as an art project or as a, as a, it does reveal something, but what it what really is inherent to policing is the invisible violence. Um, and I think we should be always sort of keeping that at the forefront of of what policing actually is. It's 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 mass violence by the state. Um, and so, like I like those those kinds of projects, but I also think that what's fundamentally missing is the violence. I just wanted to make a a, a random connection also that um, the domestic you know, investigations on terrorism um, were all rooted on white collar crime, actually investigations that, you know, the FBI came up with this grand idea in the 80s that, um, you know, the follow the money, we can follow the money. Um, that's how we, you know, that's how they busted up the mob and the mafia, um, that they would, they could use that same tactic to, um, to disrupt terrorism which is a very flawed concept in itself, actually. And there's an entire book about it uh, uh, that actually that's not how terrorism gets funded, but um, that, that they modeled uh, the Operation Vulgar Betrayal and a lot of the investigations in um, immigrant Muslim communities in the 80s and 90s on white collar crime investigations. Um, and so there's like, there's a whole history of that too. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I think that's also really powerful and important given how globalized everything is. Um, and just the ways that we see a lot of, I think that also is like why it drives me crazy when like um, non-Black Muslims like don't care about like 
predictive policing when it comes to black communities, but not surveillance of Muslim communities, for example, because like programs like countering violent extremism um, in the United States or prevent in the UK, for example, these like predictive modes of like terrorism based on um, criminalized everyday Muslim behaviors is rooted in failed gang database programs, rooted in failed predictive policing programs. Um, and so we also see like once a certain population is like a great test subject um, that's expanded very quickly uh, in order to bring in more people under the control. Um, and I think that also goes to the next question that I would love to um, bring up, which is about um, sort of the global ecosystem of all of this. Um, terror tech is not unique to the United States whatsoever. In fact, a lot of it comes from places like Israel, which is where Clearview actually is an Israeli company that Freddie was mentioning, right? They're Israeli? Probably Israeli. <laughs> they're Israeli? Pretty sure they're Israeli. Fine. Not, but, but we do have examples from like, it, like a cell phone cracking technology called Celebrate is an Israeli technology and, and there are other examples. But, but yeah, they're, anyway, I'll let you go. <laughs> No, thank you, thank you. Um, so yeah, I guess, what are the global relationships of terror tech um, as it's used? Who are some of the major players or companies? Um, and I think that this is also really important for us to be thinking about in the United States also, just because um, the November elections are coming up around the corner and a lot of, there's a lot of speculation. Um, oh, thank you, someone said. Oh yeah, I'm sure they're all Zionists. Anyway, um, there's a, the November election is coming up. And I think if the United States is to learn from a lot of other repressive regimes around the world right now um, that have been blocking internet connections, um, doing really intrusive tech related surveillance. Um, but we also see this like kind of commonplace already. So we see um, the ways in which facial recognition technology in the United States is also being used um, in Western China or East Turkmenistan, um, in the concentration camps of Muslims, Uyghur Muslims, um, and is like very instrumental, the ways in which facial recognition is used at checkpoints in Hebron, um, and is very much like normalized within many other lived experiences. And a lot of these companies are the same. Um, and shared and tested. So can we kind of unpack a little bit of this like global nature of um, surveillance and terror tech and some of those like maybe major players or those relationships? Are we all silent here? I, I think for me, I like to be very specific when I'm naming companies and, uh, and so, uh, a lot of this has slipped my mind now, um, uh, but some of the technologies and the practices are uh, transnational or shared. And like one example of that is the, um, the use of electronic monitoring. Um, so this is um, uh, some work actually coming out of uh, Chicago with the electronic monitoring group, but um, the electronic monitoring like ankle bracelets um, were like pejoratively named, but these, Technologies are used in the U.S. Um, in other sites as well too. Um, but for people, really quickly, could you describe what electronic monitoring is? Um, for the most part, that might look like um, uh, uh, a shackle, electronic shackle on one's ankle. It could be a cell phone technology um, that really, um, you know, this could be something that is used in post incarceration um, or. Um, uh, uh, other means of like monitoring someone um, outside of a, of, a, of a prison space. So in effect, making their homes and their places of work, um, you know, as they say, satellites of the carceral state. So this is a way of being, um, you know, monitored, if, whether you are um, stepping out of your home to throw out garbage or you're, you know, picking up your kid from the bus or you're at work and in a factory where the, you know, the, the range can't be heard, you could be then, um, you know, like without leave. And so, um, so that is is something that is used in you know immigrant um, detention here um, and, and uh, other means um, but it's also something that is used to for house arrest of you know kids and adults in uh, Palestine and some of these same companies um, are the you know that that produce these technologies um, you know operate um, uh, in these these two various states and so I think that um, is one is one space uh, to look at. I think you know what was uh, something that uh, the whistleblower 
um, in September of this year, um, working with the Department of Defense, and had said that the um, the the White House or whoever it was, um, the DoD, had um, requested or inquired if they can use um, you know basically heat rays on um, uh, on protesters um, at the time when they were clearing uh, Lafayette Park. And so these kinds of technologies that could be imagined as used in one field of war over there unseen, um, you know, as they say, the chickens come home to roost. And it might not necessarily be these kinds of like, you know, uh, the heat rays or the sound cannons, which they have used, whatever these kind of active denial weapons, but something, um, you know, as simple um, as a, an Apache helicopter or, or a, a helicopter of that. I think many of us, um, whether we were watching um, those, um, the uprisings uh, on TV in the, in the summer, but there was one moment or on, you know, streams through Twitter or something else where there was this low flying helicopter used as a, as a kind of to, to dis dissipate the crowd, um, which could be, you know, quite dangerous glass, trees, fly in people's and you know so those are some things that I'm um, I'm thinking about the, the other types of weaponry you know not whether it's going hand in hand with things like you know mining social media for keywords but really weaponry like a conductive energy weapon it was, if they're thinking it you know it's just like one step away from it being used and something like that heating up your body to like 150 something degrees you're supposed to run away suppose you broke your you know suppose you just couldn't get away suppose you suppose the person who's conducting it just decides not to, to turn it off you know all of these things um are are, are also you know this kind of and i know freddie wants to talk about militarization but this is also part of this large-scale you know surveillance industrial complex or uh you know military industrial complex that that go hand in hand i mean uh, thank you for that dr brown i so i was one of the people who had this these helicopters hovering over my face in uh, dc and just remember just to keep in mind that these helicopters were named after sort of brutally slaughtered a sort of uh, Native American tribes and and now we're, there's a requirement that the US Army names its helicopters after after um, after these kinds of uh, peoples um, but I think just to think about it a few different ways one is that like when we're talking about the the militarization of, of the American empire abroad, really what we're talking about is a lot of these technologies that are sort of created and tested on mostly poor and black and brown bodies. And then this idea that sort of it's being brought home is kind of, I think it's true, but it's also not true because like really what is actually happening is is the te the bodies are sort of considered the same, right? They're, they're just brown people over there somewhere. Um, and, and we see this a lot. So in, in the cell phone tracking technology, um, there's a specific vendor um, called Stingrays that they were selling these um, to, and flying them in Afghanistan and Iraq. And then that technology is brought, you know, made cheaper and then, you know, sort of used in, in the US by police departments. Um, and so that's like one example. Um, we've seen uh, places like in Baltimore, they have this ship called the Persistent Surveillance System, where it just flies around the entire city and it's supposed to be taking uh, photos 24-7. Um, and this was also built off of, uh, you know, they were building this thing to detect car bombs in Fallujah. Um, and the other thing I want to say is that, like like most things in in the U.S., uh, militarization um, and and sort of the the crackdown on black and brown bodies it employs broad bipartisan support. Um, so uh, there was a um, a vendor that was selling um, license plate reader technology at the at the border, um, and and you know they got hacked and a bunch of their data was really. Could you really could you talk a little bit about that, like like what that license plate reader technology is? Like, yeah, so so like all, like all places, like at borders, obviously, are heavily surveilled locations. And um, one of the things that the Border Patrol has been building out for probably like the last decade or so is every photo, every license plate gets photographed, uploaded. That data is shared across the country with other police departments. Other police departments take li their license plate data and share it with the federal government. And so there's this huge network of license plate data. Um, it, this data is precise enough that you could track someone, like if you know their license plate, you could track them to their house 
um, and track them and anywhere they go in real time. There was a, a story about that out of Oakland a few years ago. And also sometimes those photos include the driver and the passenger, right? That's correct. Right. Um, so it's not just license plate data, right? Um, and this company got hacked and their data was released. And, and one of the things that became clear through the, was that the lobbyist would say, okay, we didn't win the contract, but we just, we were able to get Border Patrol's budget increased to whatever. And I think one of the problems or one of the, the challenges that we're thinking about when we challenge militarization or defund the police is that like these budgets have been growing and growing and growing for so long that, you know, one of the things that has emerged is like all across the country, people are like, we're strapped for money. We have to decrease budgets um, because of the crisis. And, and they're talking about decreasing the police budget like 4%. And, and the police budget had to be trimmed anyway, because they're like such a huge part of, of budgets across the country that really cutting, you know, one police academy isn't going to do it. Cutting um, 4% isn't going to do it. 10% isn't going to do it. You know, if you look at the budgets that have grown in the last 40 years, they've grown, they've increased like three or four times that. And so what does demilitarization actually look like? What does defunding actually look like? Um, and, and so, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts. I think they're all kind of related. Um, but but um, for me, as a person who's always been like sort of anti-war um, and, and sort of anti-surveillance tech, um, I think that the framing really, my, my understanding of surveillance is really um, informed by that kind of history, that kind of uh, political uh, situation. Um, and so I don't know that we, how to, how to build a, how do we have an actual anti-war left, you know, um, when, when the Pentagon budget's the highest it's ever been in, in, in the last budget, right, in the last NDAA, which is the meta bill that funds the Pentagon. Um, so those, those are just some thoughts. I have more, but I'll leave it there to, for other people to talk. Yeah, and I'm going to also let anybody else jump in, but to add more questions into the soup of things you can pick from, um, which I think is related. There's a really good question um, by Tarek again, uh, and they say, sorry, one more question. Building on the great discussion around global terror tech, I work between the US and Pakistan, and while state surveillance is resisted in both places, these movements seem very disparate. Um, why is that and what is the potential of or for more global forms of solidarity, which I think is a really great question. I think this also brings up, it's very much related to this conversation of the globalism of terror tech. We've actually been trying to tackle this question because um, the city of Portland adopted Taka, Bangladesh as a city where it teaches policing to. And Taka is where my family's from. And so they've had this like ongoing kind of like mentorship relationship. And so technology is moving in that relationship as are their abusive racist practices and their surveillance practices. And so um, when I first found that out, I was just like this moment of like, how do I tell my cousins that they need to defund the US police too now, right? <laughs> like it's not just defunding the PPB in Portland, it's defunding the PPB now internationally. And so um, at first it was like, I had a lot of disparity around it because I was like, this thing is so big, right? And I think somebody commented on that. They were just like, this thing is so big, how do we? And then, um, I kind of had this realization that this thing is so big, not just because it's big, but also because individuals, hundreds of them made decisions to get involved in this particular thing in a particular way. And it became this thing. It wasn't just this thing that emerged out of nowhere. And so similarly, hundreds of individuals deciding to build power that looks different of deciding to build a world that looks different has the potential to build another big thing. And so we're working right now to figure out how to start Built, like connecting these um, kind of city-based struggles and to start demilitarizing what is actually like a global transnational network of exchange, both of policing practices and technologies. I'm also kind of working right now with um, folks who are involved in the BDS movement because there's so much that happens in that innovation exchange between the MOU that Obama signed and Israel. And so much- Could you define BDS and- 
these. Oh, so, so it's a boycott, div, uh, divest, and uh, sanction movement uh, with regards to um, the occupied territories in Israel and uh, profiteering that happens from that condition of uh, the occupied territories effectively being open air prisons, right? And so um, the Obama administration signed a 10 year memorandum, which allows there to be a lot of grant exchange and in like our own state of Oregon, we're, we're, we're tracking like hundreds of thousands of dollars that went to universities to develop these technologies in different ways and do it in ways that kind of cut problems in half. So you develop a very like anodyne version of the technology in the United States with the innovation resources that we have here. And then the carceral or the military other side of it gets developed other parts of the world so these very like high like extremely tight-knit research networks between israeli universities and israeli researchers in the united states and so um the transnational nature of this like terror tech network is also recognizing that cities don't exist almost like policing doesn't exist like isolated anymore in these cities right this innovation is happening in a way that's treating these cities as though they're innovation sites in connection to what is a transnational economy right so it's almost like not accidental that shot spotter which is gunshot detection software gets marketed both in chicago and johannesburg because these two cities um have a like a shared history of segregation practices and they look very similar to a um a technologist who's wanting to sell this technology right so cities start to resemble each other too and they begin to be profiled similarly so um yeah i know i wanted to address this question and say how do we make this struggle easier but i'm adding just more complexity to it but i feel like there's something very very both disparaging but also powerful in recognizing that now this is a global struggle and you know, a lot of us who are immigrants, we have family overseas who are confronting other versions of these technologies, right? And um, this this is a capacity or a potential that we can then use to build community power. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I know we're kind of running out of time and we have so many great questions. I have some questions. Um, I'm going to jump to a question in the Q&A um, and I'll save my questions at the end. There is an anonymous attendee um, who asks, I'm a tech researcher, reveal yourself. Um, it seems like if Google slash Microsoft won't build these harmful technologies for companies, then Accenture or McKenzie will. And if they don't, then companies will just build their own software in-house because you can't be competitive in this capitalist market without collecting a shit ton of data and being able to parse through it meaningfully. So what can we do and where do we start? Not a small question. And I think a lot of things that are taken as assumptions that we can also challenge. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I struggle with this a lot too because um, I look at um, campaigns that like groups like um, Mihinde build about particular companies that are building out, you know, anti-immigrant software. And, and the reality is that like, I mean, I guess not the reality, we shouldn't accept these as realities, but, but really it's, it's the amount of funding there is for, for border surveillance that we have to challenge. Um, and and there is a market there there and and there's always going to be you're always going to find a company that might want to fill that role whether it's ibm whether it's palantir whether it's whomever um but i think what they mentioned is that like you know what you have to do is make these contracts toxic make them so toxic that like only like the worst of the worst people um will touch them um, and, and so I think that's one thing. It's, it's, it's a sort of political, I guess, it's a political question. Um, as technologists, I think we have an obligation in, like, to speak out. So a perfect example is the, is the um, person who uh, blew the whistle, that uh, company called Hootsuite, which does like Twitter analytics and social media analytics was being used by ICE. And that person got fired from their job. And so like for us who have like very nice 
cushy tech jobs or ha had or have. You know, I think it just requires people to be more in, engaged politically. Um, and there, there are other ways. You see a lot of organizing in, in tech right now against these companies, um, some contracts being canceled. Um, so, so I think really it's just like two things, right? Making these companies be as toxic as possible that people don't want to work there. And you see that in some places like Palantir where undergrad students will say, we'll never work for you. Um, and, and the same thing happens at Google's with their, with, you know, one of their drone AI technologies that eventually got shut down. Um, and, and so I think you have to do it, attack it on two points, right? What like make those projects extremely toxic because of their human rights abuses. And then the other part is like actual sort of labor organizing, which is sort of kind of growing in tech, um, but, but, you know, has obviously a lot of implications for all of us. So I think just supporting it on those two fronts is what I think is politically possible. Um, I, I don't know how to attack, attack the, the funding question. Um, I think that requires actually building a more sort of militant anti-war left across the world. Um, and, and I think that's a broader question um, for that a lot of people have. I don't know. Thank you. Um, I'm going to, okay, there are some good questions in, I'm so, yeah, but we're at time. So I'm sorry, friends. Um, but you can find all of their emails online, probably. <laughs> I think everyone's emails online, almost. Um, and shoot them an email or tweet at them. We've tweeted at them. You can tweet at them if you have additional questions. Um, everyone, if you don't mind dropping your, any public information you're willing to share with the people on this, webinar um, in the chat so people can reach out directly um, or tweet at you and um, interrogate you with more questions. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Um, the very last, oh, sorry. I had to ask a quick question on behalf of Ed for Freddie and Sarah to show your cats. That was the question I had. Okay, well, you, they're cats. Okay, thank you. Um, so while they're gabbing their cats, <laughs> um, the very last question that I just want, um, if you can just go around and answer really quickly is, um, and that's also not like an easy, oh, so precious. <laughs> Wait, this is actually like, oh my God, your cats are matching. Of course you both have black cats. <laughs> this is very cute, thank you. Um, that's a uh, little, little Snowden. <laughs> Snowden's in Russia. Um, so anti surveillance cat. Oh my God. Um, anyway, so the last question that I would love everybody to like give your thoughts on, which is, I know probably a very not easy question to answer, um, but something that I think I've been thinking a lot about also, um, but just, is there a possibility to be proactive with um, responding to tech surveillance? Um, I think a lot of the work that we're able to discover is very much reactionary. So we it's being used against our communities for years and then we find out about it and then we have to like launch these like massive investigations and do all this work to figure it out and then we can start doing sort of responsive work so is there a way that we can how can we prep ourselves and be um proactive about figuring out tech um surveillance terror tech being used in our neighborhoods or possibly will be used in our neighborhoods um or if not, or also comma and, um, what are different ways that people can start um, doing this work that you all have been doing in different ways in their own communities? Um, of course, taking into consideration all of the safety precautions of the work that, because um, I know, for example, Asya in your film, the FBI literally started surveilling you as you were doing this work. And so this is not like fun work that um, everyone can just like jump in without any sort of digital protections or safety nets or really understanding what you're doing. Um, but as also Freddie mentioned many times that not everybody also has technical backgrounds. You don't have to be a coder. You don't have to be a physicist to be able to get into this work. Um, so that's sort of the two part ending question of like, can we be proactive? If so, how? Um, if not, or also yes, <laughs> how can people start figuring out what is going on in their neighborhoods around the world and organizing um, against that? Um, I'll jump in with a totally non-technical answer to that. Um, 
which is like, you know, a lot of the time we're, we're, we're responding, we're defending, we're, um, we're campaigning against, uh, you know, the FBI or the tech companies that are doing it. But, you know, one thing to understand is that, like, there are profound effects to these psychological operations on ourselves and on our communities. And, and my response is that, um, like the way to be proactive is to start facilitating healing in our own communities from this collective trauma of this surveillance. It's not something that stops. I don't think it's something that's necessarily go going to end. Um, and um, how do we heal from something that continues to happen to us is a question we ought to answer collectively in our own communities. I often think about like, um, you know, the opposite of the panopticon is that we are looking and in communication with each other, you know, around in the circle, us, and that we're able to look back at, at the center, right? So um, being in community and, and like really prioritizing our healing, talking about how this actually affects us, how it, you know, how we are petrified by it sometimes, how we're not able to move forward, um, talking about our feelings um, in community, um, and talking about that, that, you know, that there aren't just legal or technical um, solutions that, you know, that, that we need to talk about trauma. Um, we need to talk about collective healing from this trauma of surveillance. And um, that's one of the ways to be proactive from it. Um, also to, to have these conversations that are often sidelined and um, like to prioritize that, to center our healing from this um, as we continue to move through it. Um, it's a, not a technical solution at all, but it's something I think that it's for our survival, you know, and, and, and beyond survival for our, also for our growth, you know, um, that this is how we continue, you know, this is how we, we persevere, that we actually have to think about um, if these are psychological operations, how are we prioritizing the, the healing and the wellness of our, of our uh, psyche, of our, um, of our collective psyche and our individual psyches. That was incredible. Thank you. Um, also, just really quickly, sorry not to completely distract from that beautiful word. I heard you have a very cute dog that's been requested an appearance in the comment section. On a walk. <laughs> <laughs> um, but continue. Sorry. Yeah, that 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 that's my answer to um, how do we how are we proactive and how do we how do we push back against this thing. I feel like I can't follow up from that. I think healing is healing and rest and refusal are, you know, so important. Um, I, this is a, a long game as we, as we clearly know. And so, um, you know, I think it's important to look um, to the organizers that are working um, in cities on behalf of um, those who how often have no right of refusal, people who are incarcerated, um, or were incarcerated, people who are houseless, um, children, sometimes the elderly, like we're, you know, we're seeing all of these ways that, um, that uh, you know, as Sarah talked about the, the edge, the edge uses, it's often, you know, um, uh, I guess even in our current moment that these communities, it might be said that a technology is, is being installed as a form of uh, protection, but it really is, you know, a form of um, of capture. And so, I, I, I think that this kind of the, the work of the collective um, is 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 quite is important. And on, on an individual level, um, but these things are never individualized. How we spend our time and our money and where at what convenience you know what is work like for uh, uh, an essential worker a gig economy the, what, so i think it's about about um uh refusing a lot of things um the ease and so that to be done collectively i think it would be as as it always has been but to kind of you know to 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 take those histories uh, into our present Um, I think Asia brought this up, but I, I we also shouldn't discount the fact that we are surviving, right? Like th there is this like huge persistent surveillance machine terror tech enterprise and we're still surviving and we're finding ways to do it. And 
oftentimes like every time a new story comes out I feel myself getting re-traumatized and a few months ago actually Dr. Brown shared a resource from Althea about the psychological trauma of surveillance and how to yeah how to build some safeguards for yourself because I find myself every time something new comes out just being like just really I mean like was I directly impacted by this were people I know like you know just constantly being re-traumatized right but you know we're all here and um we found a way to get here and we'll continue to do that and so I think we need to recognize that we are fighting back maybe in ways that are unintelligible but they're there and we're learning from each other and we're relying from each other even if it's something as simple somebody else uses your library card right like that's an anti-surveillance tactic that's so simple but it happens on a day-to-day -day basis and we don't acknowledge it you know it's not something that gets you google funding necessarily but you know it's still important so recognizing those little gestures as to how we take care of each other and ourselves and how it's happening constantly i think you know i think that opens up some of that ease a little bit that we're looking for yeah um my only addition to all of those great comments and this is going to sound like a cop-out but it's not um, I think it's really important to read and have political education. I mean, our, our dear Chairman Fred Hampton from Chicago talks a lot about this. Like we have to fight racism with solidarity. We fight, uh, we fight racism with 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 uh, socialism or whatever it is, anti-capitalism. And and I think really like looking back on those words from fifty or you know fifty plus years on, they resonates really well with us because because you know I think the lineage of what happened to the Black Panthers through Chicago through, you know, 68 um, at the DNC to, you know, the ongoing police violence in Chicago through ongoing police surveillance. And like, we can't separate that out in any kind of significant way, but what we can do is educate ourselves a little bit, um, give ourselves a little bit more political theory and, and really sort of work through that lens. I think that's the, that's the only way. Um, so continue to read. Um, I, I will challenge myself to read more and, and I think, just building a history, you know, I think it's really important to, to like, Dr. Brown has such a great way of thinking from both the contemporary to the history of it. Um, and we need to be able to draw that line um, to see where we're going. Um, and so while I'm horrified about the future that comes ahead, I, I know that we, we're also ready to take it on. And and, and yeah, so I, that's, that's my cop out, non-answer, non-answer, but um, <laughs> there you go. But that was a beautiful answer because you're talking to a group of readers. So <laughs> um, I can't tell if that last comment was also grounding and inspiring or just terrifying. Um, but thank you. <laughs> um, thank you all so, so incredibly much for your brilliance and light and wisdom and time. Um, this is, we're coming to a close now. And I do want to just take a few quick seconds um, to talk about our Because We've Read project for this unit, which I've also talked about to, I think, most of the panelists. Um, but we are also sort of encouraging um, steps, just small steps for people to also start reckoning with the surveillance in their neighborhoods and also building a lot of these global bridges a little bit closer. Um, so the two projects that we're gonna be launching officially on Monday um, is going to be first is a member compiled um, visual database of surveillance in our neighborhoods around the world. So encouraging everybody wherever you are from Hebron to Kashmir to China um, to taking photos of the surveillance that you see in your commute around your home, um, grocery shopping, um, and being able to submit it and we can upload it to a website where we'll have the location um, and if you can name any brands that you see. So really trying to visualize this map of how connected that we are so connected um, through surveillance. So our kind of going on the topic and really being inspired by everyone's work um, who's on this panel about community building, um, watching back, um, and really just kind of understanding like and realizing and recognizing that surveillance is so ever present um, and not letting that feel normal um, and not like passing by cameras without like recognizing that those are cameras. Um, and I think that that's just a really important um, this process for all of us to even just start taking a step if for those of us who may be even newer to the concepts of surveillance to start grappling with it and also recognizing this international aspect. Um, so we have a website that's going to be launching on Monday that will be also emailed to everybody so everyone can get all their forms to send in photos. Um, and the second is more protective. So we're going to um, have a, a little toolkit for how to have an anti 
doxing party um, with your friends um, and in your community to encourage steps to practice digital safety. So everyone downloading things like Signal, um, getting off of Zoom, which we did a great job of today, um, and different ways that we can protect ourselves and scrape all personal data that has been collected little by little, um, and how to like go through that on your phone, um, but also turning it into a fun thing like a party over the internet. Um, so these are two fun projects that we're launching on Monday. And of course, this unit is two months. So we're still reading um, both Dark Matters and Surveillance Capitalism um, throughout the rest of the month. And we're also launching a Discord, um, which is like a Slack, but like encrypted-ish. Freddie, is it safe? Yeah, yeah, it's good. I feel like I just keep texting Freddie. I was like, how safe is this? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, Freddie's stamp of approval, <laughs> which means a lot. Um, so it's a Discord that basically we're encouraging more direct conversations because we're recognizing that a lot of our posts have been shadow banned on social media and we also just don't want to be overusing social media and letting all of our data be collected and sold um, by all of these really fun corporations. So um, having a Discord where we can talk geographically but also just in conversation together um, about the readings to kind of get more involved. So if you're on our email list, you also get a link to that. And if you're not, if you grab a link to the books from this unit's website, you can add, join our email list. Let's go to our website. Um, with that, thank you all so very much. Um, so, so grateful for all of the work that you do. And I'm excited. I just don't want to leave you. I'm just like, this is, <laughs> it's like, we need to like go and like scheme more. This is amazing. <laughs> this has been wonderful. Thank you, Hoda, for, you know, introducing me to this really global community that you have here. It's been, um, I'm really excited about the work that you're doing. And I'm definitely going to join um, the Discord and to be in conversation with Sarah, Freddie, and Ozzy has been, has been wonderful. So this is, I hope we can, I mean, like, I don't want to say I want to do another Zoom. I can text you, but I hope we, no I hope we can do that. this again. And like, couldn't even come out of my mouth, right? You know? But I think that is, this, is, this is really great that you're finding other ways to be in community outside of Zoom as well, too, because, you know, they are transcribing everything. Um, it, just because we don't click the button to say transcribe doesn't mean they don't have access to that. Um, so, so this is, yeah, you know, and like, I think obfuscation is also, you know, important and putting things out there. And, and being in community even on these spaces uh, is great. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Hoda, for gathering us. And thanks to each of you guys. It's been lovely to be in conversation. I'd love to catch up anytime. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. Love and hugs. Bye. Bye. Take care. Stay safe. Thank you.